people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. The undisputed super featherweight champion of the world, Alicia, the bomb gardener. Okay, and now it's time for our weekend recap. We're going to kick it off with the Golden Boy promotion show. Areli Musinho, then champion, versus Gabriela Fundoria, the challenger. And the fight more or less worked out as I predicted, as I expected, though in many ways Gabriela exceeded my expectations. The question ahead of this fight was, what? would Areli Musinho's aggression and volume punching prove to be too much for Gabriela, or would Gabriela manage the distance and catch Areli on her way in? And in many ways, we got our answer. I went with Gabriella to win a decision. She went a step further and knocked her out. Here's why. Areli Musinho being the shorter, stumpier fighter of the two, she didn't have a choice but to close the distance, try to. And given her propensity for winging shots and big looping right hands, she kept getting caught. She kept getting countered on her way in. The first round got off to a very fast start, as then champion Areli Musinho darts out of her corner and attempts to overwhelm Gabriella Fundoria with volume, closing the distance. Gabriella pumping out that jab, keeping it working as she moves. Taking a half step back as Areli comes forward to keep a bit of space between her and Areli, give herself room to work and room to pump out that jab and bring over that straight left hand, that counter left hand. Weathering the storm, the barrage of punches coming from Areli Musinho and giving herself a clear view of the target, she hurt Areli very early in the fight, in the first round, and Areli was very lucky to have survived it because as the round ended, Gabriella had her pinned down in the corner and was unloading. Areli visibly hurt. It was the counter left hand from Gabriella Fundora that calmed her down. She landed that punch upstairs and downstairs. When she did, you saw Areli's demeanor change. You saw she was hurt. You saw she didn't like it. And it was at that point that it was Gabriella that starts coming forward, stepping into her jab, taking it to Areli Musinho. Saw more of the same in the second round. Areli Musinho trying her best to bob and weave and come in behind the jab or just under it to get close to Gabriella, but she couldn't do it without coming under heavy fire, without getting hurt, without getting countered. It was a hard night at the office. Third round starts. Gabriella Fundoria is in control, circling Areli Musinho and pumping out that jab. Measuring and managing the distance as Areli Musinho struggled to get past it, struggled to get past the long, ever present jab of Gabriella Fundora. Oh. Was just picking her off with ease the entirety of the third round, that long range jab, long range punches while on the move, making it so difficult for Areli to get close to her to try and land something. I think Areli's mistake was she wasn't using her jab enough, a double jab, a triple jab. She was instead trying for big looping shots and overhand rights that consistently got her countered. That was her downfall. Nothing doing in the third round. Punishing start in the fourth as Areli Musinho was visibly hurt by a counter right hook, a counter right hook out of the southpaw stance from Gabriela Fundora, the southpaw. When it wasn't a counter left hand that stunned Areli Musinho, it was the counter right hooks. The fifth round starts, and even though Areli's already taken so many punches, so much punishment, at the hands of Gabriela Fundora, she decides she's gonna hit the gas a little more. Bum rushing Gabriela Fundora to try to crowd her, crowd the pocket. She ends up eating a hard, a really hard down the left hand, puts her on her knees. The first knockdown of the fight. And I don't know why Jack Reese let her continue. She rose to her feet. Her equilibrium was clearly off. She was stumbling around. The ropes were the only thing that held her up, but Jack, Jack gave her the benefit of the doubt, allowed her to continue, sensing that she was close to the finish. Gabriella closes the show with a barrage of punches, huge, and I mean huge 
counter right, hooks, left hands, body shots, you name it. The ropes were the only thing that held Areli Musinho up, which counted as a second knockdown in the fifth round. And before you knew it, Areli's corner had thrown the towel. There was nothing doing, nothing to gain out of letting the fight continue. She would have just ended up taking even more punishment. A sensational finish for Gabriela Fundora, the newly crowned IBF flyweight champion. There are only two champions at this weight. It's Gabriela Fundora, newly crowned IBF champion, and Marlene Esparza, oh. Ring Magazine, Lineal, WBC, WBA, and WBO champion, who is currently preoccupied with a Gabriela Alaniz rematch. Oh. And we'll see what happens with that. Because of her height, her length, her boxing acumen, and her youth. Gabriela Fundora is going to be a dangerous proposition for a lot of fighters, a lot of challengers, and a lot of champions for years to come. She's at flyweight now, but she could easily grow into super flyweight and bantamweight, super bantamweight. As she gets older and a body starts to fill out, she's got the frame for it. Endless possibilities. The prediction stuck, and I've no doubts that Gabriela will be looking to fight the winner of Esparza versus Alanis too, in order to become this division's undisputed champion. She's a tall ardor, a tall ask for any fighter in more ways than one. And I wonder that she's not a network and promotional free agent able to go into some kind of an arrangement with the people over there at Golden Boy. They could use her. She's an action fighter, she's a crowd pleaser, and she's good for a knockout, which the casuals love. Congratulations to her, this division's newly crowned IBF champion. We then come to the main event of that same show, the WBO interim welterweight title fight between Alexis Rocha, then WBO interim champion, and Giovanni Santiliang, the challenger. It was a fight where describe it. you could best describe it as Alexis Rocha being beaten at his own game, being beaten by the better man in Giovanni Santiliang, who was fighting out of a very tight guard. I don't want to say it was a high guard. It looked more like a mid guard or a, a peekaboo guard. He was able to effectively close the distance on Alexis and counter out of that guard as Alexis would try to fight him off in the first round. It was established that Giovanni looks noticeably bigger and stronger, punches straighter, counters better. Harder than Alexis Rocha. So much in common between them, between the two fighters. They're both southpaws, they're both lefties. They used to be sparring partners, sluggers. They knew each other. Though Giovanni over time must have evolved into a more dangerous version of the fighter that Alexis Rocha was trying to be this weekend because Alexis Rocha, like Giovanni, he's a slugger. He's a mid-range to inside phone booth fighter. He tries to take it to the other guy. Giovanni was taking it to him, taking it to him at the start and almost immediately you could see. There's a lot more on Giovanni's punches than Alexis's. He seems physically bigger and stronger than Alexis Rocha. Alexis, he's not a back foot guy. He's not a lateral movement guy but he was forced, Push. forced to try to be. It's the story of the fight. Giovanni stepped into Alexis's house and beat him at his own game, beat him into submission, bloodied him after the first round, bloodying his nose. And as stated, the difference between them was a marginal difference, that Giovanni Santiliang is coming forward, tucked behind that mid guard or that peekaboo guard, countering out of it as Alexis Rocha would try and create space and try to get off punches to shake him off. Giovanni would counter, and when he would counter, when he would land, fucking Alexis Rocha up. No need to be fancy. Not only were the punches from Giovanni Santiliang a lot harder than what you saw from Alexis Rocha when they were trading in the phone booth, not only were the punches harder, they were shorter, tighter, more compact. And given that he was staying on top of him, he was staying with him, he was forcing Alexis Rocha to throw, he was in essence forcing him to open up to get off even more punches, even more counters, doing a lot of damage very early in this fight. Feels like one of those things that boils down to a fighter's temperance that if you're that close to Alexis Rocha, you know what he's gonna do. He's gonna throw, he's gonna throw punches and bunches. So it's almost like Giovanni lured him into those exchanges, sucked him into a war. Fighting a fighter who was fighting a better version of the fight that he was trying to fight, it would have behooved Alexis Rocha to slow the fight down, use his boxing, but that's just it. Alexis Rocha is not that cerebral boxer, that thinking man's fighter. So what got him beat, in essence, was a guy who can fight the fight that he wants to fight in a better, more effective way. Beaten at his own game. Alexis Rocha, the Golden Boy Promotions fighter, the house fighter, 
trained by Hector Lopez, Giovanni Santiliang, the away fighter, the top-ranked fighter, the visiting fighter, trained by Robert Garcia. Very little subtleties in between them. Giovanni Santiliang, simply put, kept the pressure on, kept forcing Alexis Rocha to trade, and when they traded, kept punishing him, kept the pressure on. And it seemed like there was very little that Alexis could do about it. The WBO interim title slipping away from him, round after round, in what was a, a losing effort. On my card, I didn't have Alexis Rocha winning a single round. You saw Oscar De La Hoya earlier this week calling for promoters to work together, work together more often on the eve of Showtime leaving the sport of boxing after 37 years in the sport. Oscar, Oscar wants more promoters to work together. I wonder if he means to rethink that strategy given what happened this weekend. You let an away fighter into your airspace. And look at what he did. Look at what he did to your guy. Alexis Rocha was tabbed to become WBO champion upon Terence Crawford's ascent to the junior middleweight division that once Terence vacates those titles, Alexis is in position to pick up a newly vacated WBO title. Look what happened. Alexis Rocha's face reduced to a bloody grimace as Giovanni Santiliang rain blows down upon him. At one point, I saw Giovanni land something like, I don't know, four or five consecutive right hooks. Alexis Rocha was just getting battered, getting destroyed. Giovanni, he didn't have a scratch on him. But you know, that's how you do it. When you're the visiting fighter, when you're the away fighter, you want to make it emphatic, as emphatic, as decisive, as possible. Giovanni did that. In the fifth round, an already bloodied Alexis Rocha was sent to the canvas off a barrage of punches, a combination that Giovanni finished off with a short, sharp, strong right hook. And you knew then in the fifth that there's no way this fight goes to distance. That was the first knockdown of the fight, but not the last. In that same round, in the fifth round, plenty of time left to do more damage. Giovanni Santiliang fires off about four or five right hooks in succession that send Alexis to the canvas for the second time. Time. He's lucky to make it out of that round. That was in the fifth round. In the sixth. Both fighters standing nose to nose, toe to toe with each other in the phone booth. Within close quarters, Giovanni rips a combination, a series of punches, uppercuts up the middle that split the guard of Alexis Rocha, sending him to his knees as the referee waved it off. He was unable to turn things around, unable to go the distance with the bigger, stronger, sharper Giovanni Santiliang, who very much upset the apple cart for Alexis Rocha. It feels like it's been a long time since the people at top rank had a stake in today's welterweight division since Terence Crawford parted ways with them rather unamicably. They haven't had a horse in the race, that welterweight race, in a while, but now they do. Giovanni is WBO interim champion, which means he's now in a pole position to pick up the full title once it becomes vacant. And it's going to. Terence isn't staying there. We all know that. Giovanni fought like a man possessed. He was a machine, a terminator. He went in there, did the business, and he is the newly crowned WBO interim champion. Congratulations to him. And finally, we come to the super lightweight contest yesterday, earlier in the day, that took place at 140 pounds, the matchroom show between the former champion, Jorge Linares, and Jack Catterall. Not a good advertisement for Jack. He's looked better. How do you wrap your mind around a guy who arguably beat Josh Taylor and looked sharp and strong in his last fight looking like this in this one? Because I would grade this as a C plus kind of performance. It's not that Jack didn't win. Jack definitely won. It looked like a 9-3, maybe 8-4 kind of fight. That Jack won it. He definitely won it. But he didn't look nothing spectacular. He didn't look nothing sensational. You're in there with a 38-year-old Jorge Linares who's not the most durable guy. He's known for being chinny, and he is a naturally smaller fighter in what is only his second fight at 140 pounds. Why didn't you get the guy out of there? Because that was the expectation going in, and it's one of those things that boils down to styles. Believe it or not, it's one of those things that boil down to the propensity of the fighter, the tendencies of the fighter, that Jack Catterall, he's a thinking man's fighter. He's not a bully. He's not a pressure guy. He's not really a puncher. And even if he does pack a big enough punch to hurt a Jorge Linares, which he did, he did more than once throughout the course of this fight, Jack's not a strong finisher. 
he's not a knockout merchant. This is a guy who's more of a jabber, more of a mover, more of a thinker. A more simple-minded fighter with a more simple approach likely would have knocked out Jorge Linares. Jack had those opportunities. He hurt him at least two times, at least two times that I saw, but he didn't finish him. It's a style thing. It's a temperance thing. Jack Catterall being a thinking man's fighter, a jabber, he doesn't have the same temperance of a knockout merchant or a bully or a pressure fighter. That's just not his identity in the ring under the hot lights. So even if he did manage to hurt Jorge a couple of times, he's still not a knockout guy. And you have to give some credit to Jorge Linares who offensively, offensively, He's always been a gifted fighter offensively, one of the best straight right hands or counter right hands anywhere at or around these weights opposite the ring, a southpaw who might be susceptible to right hands. When you put it all together, it's what keeps a Jorge Linares, an aging fighter, a guy at the end of his career, that's what keeps him in the fight, that you're not being physical with him, you're not roughing him up and being rough and tumble, you're boxing him. That's what you're doing when you're fencing with the jabs and looking to create openings, looking for counters as the rounds go by, that's what keeps him in the fight. You're not rushing him and dogging him out, walking him down, you're boxing him. When have you ever seen Jack Catterall go into a fight, any fight, looking to bully the other man, looking to back him off and walk him down and rough him up? That's not his temperance as a fighter. So opposite the ring of a Jorge Linares, an older guy. What keeps him in the fight is that you're boxing him. You're not bullying him, you're boxing him. And even though you're bigger, naturally bigger and younger, the much fresher fighter of the two, you're still not a bully. That's not your propensity. That's not how you fight. So this is why, this is more or less why he didn't get the knockout, even though he did win the fight. And bear in mind, I'm not making excuses for him. I'm just wrapping my mind around how is it that the same guy who dropped Josh Taylor, the same guy who arguably won that fight and looked good in his last one earlier this year. How is it that that guy looked like that in those fights, but in this one, he looked like this against the very chinny, aged Jorge Linares. It was a C-plus performance and a poor advertisement, I think. A poor advertisement for Jack that he's looked better. You want to be in a conversation with the Regis Progres and Devin Haney's, the Teofimo Lopez's and Subriel Matias's of the world, you at least need to be able to finish, to dispatch an older, naturally smaller fighter in Jorge Linares, but you didn't do it. So, well, for this performance, I don't think most people are going to like Jack's chances against those fighters, because if you couldn't finish Jorge, you're not going to finish them. But then again, when has Jack Catterall ever been a strong finisher? His bread and butter is his boxing. And his chances against any of those aforementioned fighters were always the chance he might win on points, win on points, not win by way of knockout. He's never been a knockout merchant. So I'm not proposing that we throw the whole fighter away just because he couldn't knock out Jorge Linares. Devin Haney couldn't knock out Jorge Linares. And Devin Haney, like Jack Catterall, he's known as a thinker, not a puncher. He's known as more of a jabber and a mover, a thinker. I mean, that's what he is. So I don't think Jack... I don't think Jack is a bad fighter. I just think this was a bad showing that all boils down to styles and temperance. And that happens.